These large marine mammals are very social creatures. Killer whales, more properly known as orcas, are smart and self-aware. Orcas live in large, closely knit, highly complex social groups with cultural traditions, typically numbering 5 to 25 members. Their lifespan is long, males up to 70 years, females up to 90 years. Calves live with their mothers until sexual maturity, but quite often they stay together their whole lives. Orcas, like other types of whales and dolphins, do not belong to any country and by no means can be viewed as someone's property. Free will and freedom of movement characterize their existence. But some people take orcas out of their natural habitat for scientific and cultural purposes and put them on display in marine parks, as there will always be a bunch of onlookers willing to pay for the entertainment. Perhaps a brief trip into the past will help us to understand. In the 19th century, Europeans and North Americans came up with an incredible idea to create human zoos, which were also known as ethnological expositions, human exhibitions, and Negro villages. The purpose was to exhibit natives from different regions in their natural state. Zoo owners gladly put Africans, Native Americans, and Polynesians into their exhibits Typically, they were forcefully taken from their native land. Usually, the exhibits were arranged in the form of whole villages. Quite often, black Africans were put together with great apes to demonstrate them as an evolutionary stage between animals and civilized white people. They were forced to do tricks to entertain the audience. There were also scientists who worked in these human zoos. They were conducting experiments and were studying the behavior of the humans of lower races. Despite medical care and good food, live exhibited subjects often suffered from depression and they had high mortality rates. Wanda was the first orca captured by humans in 1961. She survived for just two days in a tank at the Marineland Aquarium in California. She supposedly committed suicide. She violently banged herself against the walls, trying to swim away. In 1964, the Vancouver Aquarium in Canada ordered a live orca as a life-size model for a sculptor. When one orca was harpooned near the shores of British Columbia, two of her pod mates came to her and started pushing the injured whale to the surface so she could breathe. Hunters had been pulling Moby Doll to Vancouver for 16 hours across a long 80 nautical miles. She didn't die. She was put into a tank where she swam in endless circles. She started accepting food only on the 55th day, but died a month later, supposedly from skin disease. An autopsy showed that Moby Doll was actually a male, but by then, it didn't matter. That's how the capture of orcas, exploitation, and slave trade started. In 1965, the owner of the Seattle Aquarium, Ted Griffin, bought from the fishermen in the port of Namu a young male orca which was accidentally caught in their nets. While Namu, named after the port by his new owner, was being loaded into the floating sea pen, his pod of 30 or so orcas stayed close by and then followed the boat for some time. The journey was long, about 450 miles, and took three weeks. For four days, a female orca with a few youngsters had been following Namu. This was most likely his mother and siblings. Namu became the first orca to perform for the public, and according to Griffin, money started pouring into his pocket. At the same time, 1965 marks the first protests against the orca captures. Griffin caught another orca in 1965 to keep Namu company, a three-year-old whale, and shot her mother during the capture, who drowned in front of her daughter's eyes. The captured whale got her name from Namu. She plus Namu equaled Shamu. Shamu acted aggressively toward Griffin. She tried to smash him in the water when he was sitting on top of the whale or was just in the pool. Ted decided to get rid of her and sold Shamu to SeaWorld in San Diego. Shamu became the fourth captured orca and the first orca ever to be transported by plane. Nemu survived for 11 months in the waterfront pen in Seattle. 
One day before his death, Nemu stopped reacting to people and banged himself full speed against the walls of his pen in an attempt to swim away. A popular movie starring Nemu was released in 1966. Shamu survived in captivity longer than Nemu. She was the star of the Shamu show. The name Shamu was trademarked by SeaWorld and has been given to different orcas at different times when performing in Shamu shows. In 1971, a SeaWorld secretary, Annette Eckes, was allowed to ride Shamu for a publicity shoot. Suddenly, the whale turned on her, tossed Annette into the water, grabbed her leg, and started pulling her around the tank, refusing to let go. The whale's jaws were finally opened with poles, and the woman required many stitches to close her wounds. Three months later, after six years in captivity, Shamu died at the age of nine. In 1965, Ted Griffin and Don Goldsberry created a team and started trapping orcas in the waters of Washington State and the Canadian province of British Columbia. The main tactic was locating orca pods from the air, driving them into coves with boats and seal bombs, and throwing a wall of nets across their escape path. The hunting team even got an order from the Pentagon, where they studied dolphins for military purposes and were interested in orcas as well. Two orcas, Ishmael and Ahab, had been delivered to a naval military base in Hawaii in 1968 for use in Project Deep Object Recovery. Ishmael escaped two years later, and Ahab died after spending five and a half years in captivity. Even back in the 70s, the Pentagon supplied Griffin with advanced electronic equipment for tracking whales in any weather conditions. Griffin and Goldsberry sold about 30 orcas to different marine parks from 1965 to 1972, getting 20 to $25,000 for each whale. During an infamous 1970 roundup in Puget Sound, the Griffin Goldsberry team trapped about 80 whales. While in Penn Cove, they used nets and power boats to separate calves from their mothers. The horrible cries had been heard all around. Mothers were trying to help their offspring and were not leaving the capture site. The hunters selected seven young orcas and sold them to different parks in America, Britain, Australia, and Japan. Among them was four-year-old Tokate, who ended up in Marine Sequarium and was renamed Lolita. Five whales died during that capture. They were cut open and sunk with the help of metal chains. Half a year later, their bodies washed ashore, which caused incredible public outrage. People were very concerned about the Orca Gold Rush, and a wave of protests and demonstrations started around the globe. In 1970, Canada passed laws regulating orca captures, with one of the regulations requiring a mandatory permit for capture. In 1972, the U.S. passed the Marine Mammal Protection Law, which prohibits taking marine mammals from U.S. waters without a special permit. Still, SeaWorld keeps obtaining permits for captures for educational purposes. Canadian marine biologist Michael Big discovered that an orca's dorsal fin is similar to human fingerprints in that it is individual and unique. Starting in 1972, scientists started collecting photos of the dorsal fins and systematizing data about the numbers of orcas. It turned out that there were far fewer orcas in the Northeast Pacific than previously thought, not thousands, but hundreds scientists began conducting some serious research into marine mammals. In 1975, due to the actions of environmentalists and Michael Biggs' research publications, Canada banned orca captures. From 1964 to 1975, 25 orcas had been captured in the waters of British Columbia. In 1976, the governor of Washington state was informed that SeaWorld's captors were using aircraft and explosives to herd and net the whales, which was a clear violation of the terms of their collection permit. Consequently, the court ordered a ban on orca captures by SeaWorld in the state of Washington. Overall, 300 orcas had been netted in the waters of the U.S. and Canada until 1976. Some killer whales managed to escape some were released, 
and at least 12 died during capture attempts. About 56 young orcas were sold to marine parks all over the world. 16 of them died within one year of capture, and then the others died as well, leaving only two alive. Corky, who was captured in British Columbia in December 1969, still lives in SeaWorld San Diego. Lolita has been held in the Miami Seaquarium since 1970. Ted Griffin left his business in 1972 after the passing of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Don Goldsberry became SeaWorld's lead collector until he retired in the late 1980s. Starting in 1976, capture activity moved to the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. From 1955 to 1972, Icelandic fishermen killed around 300 orcas as they were competitors for fish. From 1975, capture operations and the issue of permits was regulated by the Icelandic Ministry of Fisheries. After Puget Sound, SeaWorld did not want to be officially involved, but Don Goldsberry agreed to unofficially assist less experienced collectors, including John Gunnarsson of Sidurafsnid Aquarium in Iceland and W.H. Dudok van Heel from Dolphinarium Hardervake in Holland. The main method of capture worked like this. When the pod of orcas was spotted in the open sea, they were lured into the nets with fish thrown from the boats. The selected whale was then lifted from the water with a special frame. From 1976 to 1989, 64 orcas had been captured in the waters of Iceland. Of those 64, 55 have been sold into different aquariums and marine parks. Only six survive to this day. Katina and Tilikum are in SeaWorld Orlando. Kasatka and Ulysses are in SeaWorld San Diego. Kiska is at Marineland in Ontario, Canada. And Stella is in Port Nagoya in Japan. Due to public pressure, many countries have now passed laws protecting whales and dolphins. In 1978, New Zealand passed the Marine Mammals Protection Law, and in 1980, a similar law was passed in Australia. Britain did not pass a law prohibiting captures and having marine mammals in captivity, but there had been significant changes regulating their welfare in captivity, so many dolphinariums started to close their doors since they could not meet the new requirements. Under public pressure in 1985, the Department of the Environment commissioned biologists Dr. Margaret Klinowska and Dr. Susan Brown to research and review the keeping of cetaceans in UK zoos and aquaria. Their report, A Review of Dolphin Area, was published in 1986 and contained different recommendations regarding the welfare of cetaceans in captivity, changes which had to be implemented no later than 1993. In 1991, Windsor Park could no longer afford the reconstruction of their orca tank and had to return Winnie to SeaWorld Orlando. A year later, the last dolphinarium in England closed its doors. In 1982, the representative of a Canadian aquarium, despite having obtained a capture permit, wasn't able to use it because of protests held by activists, both on land and on the water. He gave up and bought three orcas from Iceland. In 1983, SeaWorld had tried to establish the capture of orcas in Alaska, having obtained a permit to capture 100 whales, out of which about 90 were supposed to be taken temporarily for research and then released, with 10 for marine parks. After three years of court battles, with public outrage in the background, the result was SeaWorld pulling out of Alaska. <laughs> In 1985, an orca named Kalina was born in SeaWorld Orlando. She was called Baby Shamu. She was the first orca to survive out of 10 calves that had been born in captivity before 1985. Five were stillborn, and all the others died within two months of their births. Starting in 1989, American marine parks switched completely to breeding captive marine mammals. In 1989, the last four orcas were caught in Iceland. Under international pressure from different environmental organizations and conservation groups, Iceland stopped issuing permits in 1990. 
The first human being to be killed by a captive orca happened in February 1991. 20-year-old student Kelty Byrne, who worked as a part-time trainer, had slipped and fallen into the orca tank at Sealand of the Pacific. Although Tillicum wasn't the first one who began dragging Kelty, he took part, along with Haida and Nootka, in tossing the trainer from one orca to another. The girl tried to escape, and her screams were heard by other trainers who desperately tried to help. Kelty Byrne died in front of a group of horrified visitors. It was the first signal of aggressive behavior by Tillicum. Tillicum was caught in 1983 in Iceland, and the next year was shipped to Canada. Since 1992, he's been living at SeaWorld in Orlando. In June 1999, 27-year-old Daniel Dukes, a SeaWorld visitor, stayed in the park after it was closed. At some point during the night, he stripped down to his swim trunks, placed his clothes into a neat pile, and jumped into the pool. The next day, his dead body was found in Tillicum's tank. In 1997, in Taiji, Japan, a pod of 10 orcas was rounded up and driven into shallow water. Five were taken and sold to marine parks across Japan. Two of them quickly died. Overall, 28 orcas have been caught in Japan since 1972. Usually, orcas died either during the captures or soon after. No marine park wanted to buy orcas from Japan due to their infamous practice of dolphin drive hunts. In 1998, an orca named Keiko was being shipped by plane from Oregon to Iceland to be released. Keiko was captured in 1979 when he was a calf near the shores of Iceland. He was caught for a local aquarium, but three years later was sold to Canada, where he performed at Marineland. Back then, he developed skin lesions indicative of poor health. In 1985, Keiko was sold to Mexico, where he lived in horrible conditions. In 1993, the movie Free Willy, starring Keiko, hit the screens worldwide. The film ends with the whale being released into the wild. This movie inspired people all over the world, and the fund Free Willy Keiko was created in 1995 and quickly collected several million dollars. The plan to release Keiko caused a lot of controversy, but the project became a true international movement. Keiko was first moved to Oregon to be placed in a specially designed pool for rehabilitation. When Keiko was released into his native Icelandic waters, the fund kept observing him and occasionally feeding him as well. Keiko lived free for five years and didn't lose contact with humans. He died near Norway in 2003, supposedly from pneumonia at the age of 27. During the time Keiko was being rehabilitated, a total of 17 orcas died in captivity in different marine parks. In 1999, the Far East Russia Orca Project, or FAROP, was conceived and developed to study orcas in their natural environment by Dr. Alexander Burden from the Kamchatka Institute of Ecology and Nature Management, Eric Hoyt, a senior research fellow with the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society, and Japanese researcher Haruko Sato. In the early 2000s, Russia started its own history of wild orca captures after all other countries stopped this practice. The Russian government regulates orca capture and annually set a quota of about 10 orcas as the total allowable take. The first attempt to trap took place in 2002, but all the netted orcas managed to break free and escape. In Avacha Bay, the company Pacific Aqua Trading, together with the experts from Utrich Dolphinarium on the trawler Nazimovo, had made 11 attempts at orca netting since August 25th, 2003. On September the 26th, south of Cape Opasny, the hunters managed to trap a large group of orcas, around 30. According to a witness, after being netted, at first, the whales panicked. Then, in a few minutes, the adults started rolling over the top of the nets, flipping over them, belly up. Young orcas rushed, trying to break through the nets. One of the young got tangled in the nets. It took a lot of effort to untangle the orca and then lift her onto the deck. When the purse sane nets were lifted, the captors found another whale that had gotten stuck in the depths and drowned. The captured female orca spent 10 days in the floating pen in Avachinsky Cove. 
During this time, experts from Utrecht Dolphinarium tried feeding the whale thawed fish, but there is no direct evidence that she ate any. On October the 5th, the whale was put into a tub and loaded onto a cargo plane. Forty hours passed between the capture and the moment the orca arrived at the Utrecht Dolphinarium. The orca survived for only 13 days in the facility, being held in a round iron tank which was drained every day, allowing experts to assess the animal. Blood tests, as well as breath and excrement samples, had been collected regularly. Blood tests indicated that an inflammatory process had developed due to stress. Despite the administration of antibiotics, multivitamins, and antidepressants, the orca died. On December 9th in 2003, the circumstances of the capture and death of the orca were discussed at a meeting of the Marine Mammals Council where the director of the Utrecht Dolphinarium, Dr. Lev Mukamatov, presented his report. There were no suggestions or arguments in favor of banning captures in Russia for scientific or educational purposes. In 2005, Utrich Dolphinarium on board Putiatin tried to trap killer whales, although there was no approved quota for the region. Between 2005 and 2010, the Pavlovskaya Sloboda Company attempted to capture orcas in the northern part of the Ohokotsk Sea, but did not succeed. In 2009, the media reported that two companies, Utrich Dolphinarium and Pavlovskaya Sloboda, received permission to capture young orcas for display in Moscow. The population of southern resident killer whales that live in the waters of Washington State and British Columbia could not recover from the damage caused by captures, and there were only 78 individuals left. In 2001, Canada, and in 2005, the United States, listed the southern resident killer whales as an endangered species. Just before Christmas 2009, 29-year-old trainer Alex Martinez was killed by an orca named Quito in Laurel Park, Tenerife in the Canary Islands. The orca killed Martinez by holding him for two and a half minutes at the bottom of the 12-meter pool. Originally, Laurel Park described the death as an accident and insisted there was no evidence of violence. However, later, an autopsy revealed that Martinez died because of serious injuries inflicted by Quito, compression of vital organs and bites. On February 24, 2010, at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida, an orca named Tillicum killed his trainer, Don Bronchot. She had worked at the park since 1994 and was one of SeaWorld's best trainers and completely dedicated to the animals and her job. The incident happened during the show Dine with Shamu. Investigations, testimony from witnesses, and footage from cameras all indicate that before the attack, Don Bronchot was next to Tilly at the edge of the pool, explaining to the audience what would happen during the show. According to witnesses, Tillicum grabbed her ponytail, pulled her into the pool, and began swinging her around with his mouth. Some witnesses insist she was pulled by her arm. SeaWorld employees used nets and food to distract Tillicum and managed to lure him into the medical pool where he finally let go of the trainer's body. An autopsy confirmed death from both drowning and inflicted injuries. She had fractured ribs, a fractured jaw, her scalp and her left arm were torn off, and her spinal cord had been ruptured. Following the incident, Tillicum was isolated in a tiny pool where he barely fit, and he spent the whole year there. He refused to perform, and he was put into shows and then removed from them time after time. Because of this incident, it is now required by United States law that SeaWorld's trainers only interact with orcas from behind a barrier. Cases of killing people, nevertheless, have not stopped the active use of Tillicum sperm for artificial insemination. Tilly has produced more offspring than any other male orca in captivity. He has fathered at least 21 calves, 11 of which are alive at this moment. Tillicum is not the only orca to have behaved in an unfriendly manner towards humans. 
There are many examples of aggressive behaviors exhibited by orcas in captivity. SeaWorld possesses 600 pages of documentation on more than 100 incidents. Only a few of those have been made public. For example, a female orca named Kasatka, who was captured in Iceland in 1978 when she was just one year old, displayed aggressive behavior on multiple occasions. Kasatka tried to bite her trainer during the show in 1993 and then again in 1999. In November 2006, during a show at SeaWorld San Diego, Kasatka grabbed trainer Ken Peters by the foot and dragged him to the bottom of the tank a few times. The trainer suffered wounds and torn ligaments in both legs, but he survived. Why do orcas act aggressively in captivity? There are many reasons. Marine mammals experience incredible stress during captures, and they often witness the deaths of their family members. Usually, orcas are stolen from their families at a very young age, and just like human kids, they miss their mothers and their pod. Instead of a naturally formed family, they have to survive in forced associations with orcas from different pods without any chance to swim away or be alone. They also suffer from the complete opposite, total loneliness. In captivity, they cannot swim 100 miles in a day as they do in the wild. In captivity, they have to eat whatever is given to them by humans. They cannot hunt for live fish like the wild resident orcas do, or for seals, as do transient mammal-eating orcas. All captive orcas are forced to perform tricks, so food deprivation is built into animal training programs. Trainers use positive reinforcement, meaning prisoners are held hungry and rewarded with food for good behavior. Shows don't have any educational value. They feature animals in an artificially created environment, performing unnatural behaviors with the only purpose being to display the dominance of a human that can make a killer whale perform tricks. A boring life in a small enclosed space surrounded by concrete walls and a total dependence on human caregivers creates incredible stress and depression which compromises the immune system and causes low energy and a predisposition to disease. The water in the tank is a saturated solution of chemicals and orca waste which can cause many kinds of diseases due to weakened immune systems. This is the reason why orcas are often medicated to keep them relatively healthy, including mentally and psychologically. Despite all the medical care, there is still a high mortality rate and displays of abnormal behavior. Orcas chewing on metal gates, wearing down their teeth, biting a cement structure in the pool, banging their bodies against the walls and showing aggression toward humans and each other. Disturbing footage shows a killer whale named Morgan in Laurel Park in Tenerife and the Canary Islands appearing to bang its head repeatedly against a metal gate while being panicked in the medical pool. Morgan was found in a severely weakened state in the Vaden Sea near the Netherlands in the summer of 2010 when the emaciated orca put on weight and got healthy in the Netherlands Dolphinarium instead of being released Morgan was shipped to Laurel Park where she still lives. In July 2010, in the Sea of Okhotsk, off the eastern coast of Russia, one orca was captured near Chuklov Island by beluga whale hunters. The capture of the orca was not planned in advance. The team was getting ready for the capture of belugas, but when a pod of orcas was spotted nearby, they decided to try their luck despite not having any permit. What happened to the other pod members remains unknown, if they sustained injuries or died in the process. While the captured orca was held in the temporary netted enclosure, the hunters tried to obtain a permit, but during a storm in the middle of August, the orca escaped. One killer whale was captured in 2010 by the Utrecht Dolphinarium in the western part of the Okhotsk Sea, but later, according to the team that performed the capture, the orca escaped. In 2012, the Russian Department of Fisheries issued four permits for the capture of six orcas. According to an official report, there was just one orca captured, but according to unofficial information, one more and possibly two orcas died during the capture. A five-year-old orca was trapped by the Sochinsky Delfinari in August 2012 in the Sea of Okhotsk. She was named Narnia and had been kept in a sea pen of the Pacific Research Fisheries Center 
near the city of Nakhodka in Russia for a year and a half before she was shipped to Moscow. The fact that the Sochinsky Delfinary and White Whale are run by the same people is supported by the following document. The head of the company, White Whale, Kirill Mikhailov, invited different scientific and educational institutes to collaborate, and he promised them access to different types of marine mammals, including orcas. In 2013, five permits were issued to the following companies. According to reports by these organizations, six orcas have been captured, although in fact, in August 2013, only three young ones have been caught. According to testimony from local fishermen, at least one more orca died during the capture. One young male orca, captured by Sochinsky Delfinari, would be named Nord. These three orcas were put into the same small sea pen as Narnia, in the Tinro Center near Nakotka. According to information from a credible source, orcas have been captured near Cape Petrovsky, on the western part of the Sea of Okotsk. A group of orcas has been netted, and then three of them were pulled ashore with the help of a rope that was put around their tails and put in the netted enclosure constructed in the river. Soon the orcas got sick because of the fresh water, and they had to be brought back to the sea in the same way. The orcas were transported by truck to the Pacific Research Fishery Center near Nakodka within a week and placed in the sea pen with Narnia, who had spent a year in solitary confinement. According to the vets, all three orcas arrived in a very bad condition and refused to eat. Trainers could not do anything, but Narnia helped. She put fish into the orcas' mouths and eventually they began to eat. On December 2nd, 2013, under the highest secrecy, a special flight, Vladivostok, Krasnoyarsk, Moscow, which lasted 10 hours, delivered two orcas, Narnia and Nord, to a temporary pool at the All-Russian Exhibition Center in Moscow. That whole year, the orcas would be held in two rusty tanks under an inflatable hangar, which was kept completely secret from the public. According to information obtained from the Unified Automated System of Customs Authorities, two orcas were exported from Russia to China by the Sochinsky Dolphinary in 2013. In July 2014, two killer whales were illegally caught off Russia's east coast. It was illegal because the 2014 total allowable catch of orcas had not yet been approved. The captors provided documents from 2013 to inspectors and claimed that the killer whales were captured in 2013 and kept all winter in the Gulf of Nicholas. However, the Gulf completely freezes in the winter, making the overwinter housing of orcas there impossible. This obvious lie explains why Sochinsky Delfinari spread the information about six orcas that had been allegedly captured instead of the fact that in reality only three had been caught in August 2013. On August 30th, 2014, in the fishing grounds on the Gulf of Sakhalin, border guards stumbled upon an orca in a makeshift tank without any capture permit. The fishermen reported that the orca was sick and that they were going to cure and release her. On September 12th, Mr. Stolbov provided information that the orca had been released due to a leak of water from a temporary reservoir. But then the same orca was found among three intended for export to China. A criminal case was opened, and in November 2014, Stolbov was fined 50,000 rubles, or about $1,000. In July 2014, it was reported that the experts of the Russian State Ecological Authority were given an ultimatum. Either they approved whale capture, or they would be replaced. When the quotas were approved in the fall of 2014, seven permits to capture orcas for educational purposes from September to December were issued. One more permit had been issued to Tinro Center to capture for the purposes of scientific research. According to official reports, the number of captured orcas was six. From all of the permits, except those issued to Kostov and Tinro Center, the number of orcas that died during captures was not specified in the report. In 2014, five orcas were shipped to China by the companies White Whale, Sochinsky Delfinari, Oceanarium DV, and Athelina. One orca, Malishka, from the 2014 late summer captures, 
had been delivered to Moscow in December and given the stage name Juliet. In December 2014, all three orcas were moved from a temporary tank to the new Oceanarium at the All-Russian Exhibition Center in Moscow, which was still under construction. So, from the time a new Oceanarium in Moscow, called the Moskvarium, opened August 5th, 2015 until now, three transient orcas have been performing. Nine-year-old Narnia, seven-year-old Unord, and five-year-old Juliet. At first, during the show on Moskvarium, the audience was told that the orcas had been rescued from poachers. But how it happened in reality, the fishermen hunters can tell the story. According to the article, The Cry of an Orca, when fishermen are accepted into the capture team, each hunter has to sign a non-disclosure agreement concerning the methods of capture. But since there is no such thing as a secret in the village, the people know their heroes and the way they really harvest an orca from the sea. It's very simple. It's either you or them. Adult females and males trying to save their calves from captors are killed. They will tell you a secret that, in the business of orca captures, Kirill Mikhailov is the main person. The Far East captures, and he sells. The trade and ownership of marine mammals is a very profitable business. During the first ever purchase of a captured orca in 1965, Ted Griffin paid $8,000 for Namu. Then, he started selling orcas for $25,000 in the late 60s. Today, the price of one orca sold to an oceanarium is between $2 million and $7 million. The irony is that all Russian companies that are involved in the capture and sale of orcas are members of the so-called Association for the Coordination of Protection and Conservation of Marine Mammals. The CEO is Kirill Mikhailov. In 2015, eight permits for capture have been issued to the companies Sochinsky Delfinari, Oceanarium DV, Afalina, and Tinro Center. According to an answer given by the Amur Department of Fisheries, all 2015 quotas for orca captures have been reached. As of December 1st, 2015, there have been seven orcas held in a sea pen near Nakodka by White Whale, Sochinsky Delfinari, Afalina, Oceanarium DV, and Tinro Center. We know the name of the orca belonging to Tinro Center, Malvina. Late in December 2015, two of those orcas were shipped to China by White Whale, founders Kirill Mikhailov and Vladimir Frolov, Afalina, founder Alexander Pozniakov, director Alexei Reshitov. Worldwide public opposition to the capture and captivity of orcas never stopped. From the time of the first captures, it only grew and became stronger. There are many organizations and individual citizens who participate in protests, demonstrations, and marches, who negotiate and try to push legislation to stop the inhumane practice of holding cetaceans in captivity. In spring 2016, due to unrelenting public pressure, SeaWorld made an announcement that it would stop its orca breeding program. In Russia, we see the beginnings of the movement against the capture of orcas. In Russia, 2016 quotas on orca captures haven't been distributed, but there is not any officially confirmed information that four orcas have been captured this summer. Allegedly, the person involved in these illegal captures is businessman Alexander Bronikov, the founder of Oceanarium DV, who built his own holding base for marine mammals with an airstrip. Another person involved is Mikhailov, who is directly connected to several companies, so the name of the company doesn't matter that much, it's still obvious that Kirill Mikhailov is behind it. In summer 2016, the Orca Malvina disappeared from a sea pen in the Tinro Center in the Russian Far East. The circumstances under which it happened are not clear. Supposedly, four orcas had been exported to China by the late summer of 2016, but it's quite possible there have been more than four transported from Russia. China, the main buyer of orcas from Russia, confirmed that they have 15 orcas as of the fall of 2016. From 2013 to 2015, 
Nine orcas were exported to the Chimalong Ocean Kingdom, where the orca show is scheduled to start in 2017. The Ministry of Agriculture in China confirmed this in December 2015. The Hai Chang Group imported four orcas from Russia for the Shanghai Hai Chang Polar Ocean World, which is still under construction. These four orcas are being held temporarily in Dalian Lahutan Ocean Park, which also belongs to the Hai Chang Group. Linyi Polar Ocean Park, which is still under construction, has announced that two Russian orcas will meet the public on or around the next spring festival. Overall, worldwide, starting in 1961, 160 orcas have been captured from marine parks. Out of that total, 127 have died. Altogether, 163 orcas have died in oceanariums, not including miscarriages and those that were stillborn. Today, around 61 orcas are held in 14 marine parks in eight different countries. Out of that, 28 are wild caught, 33 were born in captivity. 24 orcas are located in the U.S., one in Canada, one in Argentina, four in France, six in Spain, three in Russia, 15 in China, and seven in Japan. Dolphinarium prisons with bad waters and walls to be fall for the freedom for the deepest free falls. One day people will wake up But there are always amazing things that surround us. While some try to profit from the misery of orcas, others help them to survive. In Russia, along with multiple inhumane companies that capture orcas from the wild and sell them, there are also very different types of people. On April the 19th, 2016, on Sakhalin Island in the Russian Far East, four orcas got trapped in the ice near the southeastern shore of the island. It took almost a day to try and save one of the orcas, a five-year-old male who was given the name Willie. Alexander Ivelsky, an employee of the Russian Ministry of Emergency Situations in the Sakhalin region, said that there was a moment during the day when Willie got exhausted. For three minutes or so, he was just crying. It was crying. Not howling, not humming, not squealing, but definitely crying. And it sent shivers down my spine. Like he was telling us, that's it guys, thank you, but I give up. Then he rolled onto his side with his blowhole submerged underwater. Stopped moving, just spasms in his tail. And we all got silent. One of the guys murmured, that's it, 36th. That's what we call a corpse in fireman slang. Then something stung us. The rescuers, still in their wetsuits, jumped into the water. Others kept working from the ice. With renewed determination, we kept fighting for Willie's life. First, we turned him up so he could breathe. He probably still had some strength, as he apparently changed his mind about dying and took a breath. Then we moved him to a deeper area and turned him completely into a normal position. And he came alive, started to breathe and move. Then help came from where it was least expected. The same wave that brought ice into the air hole freed up the path for three orcas that were farther from the shore than Willie and allowed them to swim back out to sea. One of them was a calf, but Willie stayed trapped. The rescue team discussed the situation and decided to stay overnight. Then guys from the diving club, the vet, and other people from the local community joined them as well. They covered the orca with tarps, gave him an adrenaline shot, put ointment on his wounds, and tried to support him. Dmitry Mikhailov, the head of the Russian Ministry of Emergency Situations in the Sakhalin region, who himself spent a lot of time in the water, said two things impressed him the most. How hard everyone tried to save the whale, and how happy everyone was when Willie was set free. Alexander Ivelsky, who helped Willie, at the end of his Facebook post about the rescue operation said, Orcas and other dolphins are so much like us humans in so many ways. Voice, communications, reactions. I will never go to see dolphins in captivity.
We're free in the ocean. 